Chapter 11, 1875 to 1909, True Grit. Bass lay beneath some brush and watched the cabin a half mile away in the approaching twilight. It was back in a cut in the Cherokee Hills. It was starting to rain. He was grateful for the rain because he was disguised as a bum, just looking for food. And the worse his clothes looked, the better. His good horse, a red stallion with a white blaze, was tied a mile and a half back in a stand of thick aspen where he wouldn't be found. Bass was riding an old mule that he'd brought with him as part of his disguise. The day before, he had crossed the deadline, a line 80 miles west of Fort Smith, Arkansas. Most deputy marshals didn't cross it, and those who did were almost always killed. For the past 30 miles, he'd been ex in extremely dangerous territory. He was glad to look like a bum who didn't have anything worth stealing. It gave Bass a deep thrill each time he crossed the deadline, like pulling a lion's beard. Bass scratched his cheek. Three weeks earlier, on a short run that ended in a wild gun battle, he had disguised himself as a woman. He had had to shave off his handlebar mustache and had worn a big sunbonnet and a full skirted gingham dress. He had gone into the camp of a gang of horse thieves and killers, pretending to be an old lady who was a friend of a gang's mem gang member's mother. Bass had expected just three or four outlaws, but there were over a dozen. He still thought he might be able to pull it off and get the two men he was after by waiting until the others rode away. But one of the outlaws noticed that Bass is the ugliest woman I ever seen. She has a beard showing. Somebody in the cabin wanted proof he was a woman. And when he pulled a gun instead and told the men they were under arrest and to surrender peaceful like, somebody yelled, hell, he ain't nothing but an old lady and started firing. They shot holes in his dress, shot his bonnet brim off, cut his gun belt under his dress and shot a boot hill off before he gained control of the situation by killing two of them and wounding two others. Bass smiled now, remembering the look on Judge Parker's face when he came riding into Fort Smith with 10 live prisoners tied together in tow and two dead draped over their horses. When the wounded men had complained about being tied together, he just said, it's easier to carry you dead. When they looked at the bodies of their companions, they quieted down. Parker had called him my bargain basement deputy, saying he brings them in cheaper by the dozen. Now Bass narrowed his eyes. The door of the cabin opened and a man came out and relieved himself off to the side. It looked like Dozier, but at this distance, he couldn't be sure. He had been hunting Bob Dozier, who was wanted for horse thievery and for killing the droves who had the horses for almost three years now. Bass had come close to catching him but the man was slippery. But Bass knew for certain this time that there were only three men in the cabin. Everything was going well, he thought, glad of his disguise, but sick of lying in the mud. Man wasn't supposed to lie in mud. It wasn't natural. He eased the Colt 3840 into a more protective position under his clothes. Normally, he carried two of them, with butts facing forward for a faster draw and more safely when riding in thick brush. Pat Brush could snag on the hammer, cock the piece, and discharge it down into the horse. This had happened to many a cowboy chasing wild cows. Bess also had a Winchester lever action rifle chambered for the same round, 3840. So he usually had to carry only one kind of ammunition. But he had left the rifle and his other pistol and gun belt with the stallion. No bum would have a weapon. And if this was going to work at all, he had to play the part well. He felt night coming on. He felt a night chill coming on. It was summer, but the rain had soaked him and a faint breeze blew. He stood slowly and went back to the mule. He had an old saddle on it, all part of this disguise, which he used fairly often. He almost also posed as a drover, a cowboy, a dirt farmer, and an outlaw. Anything to get close enough, you had to get close so you could smell their breath. He mounted the mule and forced himself to slouch. Normally, he sat straight up on the stallion. He was a master horseman. 
but an old drunken bum would hang over the mule like the old clothes he wore. He had even taken the heels off a pair of boots, so he would walk in a shambling, drunken gait. Half a mile to the cabin. It was dark enough now so that a lantern shone through an oil-papered window. He knew they wouldn't be able to see him coming in the rain with the dark hills in back of him. With the mule walking in mud, they probably wouldn't even hear his hooves on the ground. Bass rode up to the cabin door without being discovered. He sat for a moment preparing. When there was time, there wasn't always, he would compose himself and try to anticipate how things might go. There were three men, all potentially dangerous. He had a warrant for Dozier and a couple of John Doe warrants if he needed them. He would knock on the door, pretend to be begging for food, and take it from there. He stood down from the mule, adjusted his revolver under his coat so he could get it in a hurry. Then he knocked on the door. The talk inside stopped instantly, and he heard stools or chairs scraping as people got up, footsteps, a moment's hesitation, and then the door opened a crack, a gun barrel poked out. Sorry, boss, don't mean no trouble, just looking for some work to make, to, to make some food. Boss, Bass moved back to appear less threatening. Mighty hungry, boss, eat just about anything. The door opened wider and a face appeared. Not dozier, white man, mid-twenties, stood looking at Bass in the dim lantern light, then turned back in the room. Hell, Bob, it's just some old nigger begging for food. We could let him peel the potato. Old nigger, hell, that's Reeves! Bass knocked the barrel of the young man's revolver up in the air and threw his shoulder against the door, jamming it in against the man, knocking him to the floor, sprawling, the gun flying out of his hand. Bass drew his colt as he came in. But at the same time, there was the sound of a door slamming open on the other side of the house. Most hideouts had an escape door in the back, and Dozier had gone out as Bass came in. Bass kicked the gun away and the man on, from the man on the floor. The second man stood by a cook stove holding a frying pan, his mouth open. Your gun, Bass said, pointing at the man's belt and holster. Out now, two fingers, throw it over here. To a rung, I'll kill you. I ain't got papers on either one of you, so don't push the hand. Both you leave your weapons and run outside and just keep running north and I'll let you go this time. Don't come back or I'll kill you. Do you believe me? Are you Baz Reeves? The man by the stove had thrown his gun away on the floor. Yes, then I believe you. Yet, horses? No, on foot. Go now before I put one in you for luck. Both men jumped to the door and vanished in the rain and dark. Bass went to the back door. He thought Bob might make a run for the crowd just use the house. He might try to get to a horse and ride, but Bass was wrong. There hadn't been enough time and Dozier had elected to stay and fight. As Bass came to the door, he hesitated, peered around the doorframe, and for his foolishness, was rewarded by a splinter of wood chips in his eyes as Dozier fired and missed his head by not more than three inches. Bass went out the front door and then worked around the west end of the cabin. He stopped at the corner. The rain was coming hard, but he was sure he heard footsteps running away to the south. He jumped around the corner and ran after them. Stupid, he thought, chasing after him in the dark. But he kept going, and this time his luck held. He saw Dozier trying to run ahead of him. The mud was ankle deep and it slow as Dozier was going. Bass could barely keep up. The range was terrible for a handgun in the dark, a good 40 yards, but he stopped and squeezed off around. Shot too wide, to the right. But the sound of the shot made Dozier stop and turn and he fired twice at Bass, missed. Bass had kept moving and had closed the distance to 30 yards. Bass stopped, aimed more carefully and fired again. Dozier jerked in a half spin to the right and then straightened up. His gun arm hung down, but he reached across with a left hand and took the gun from his useless right one, starting to bring it up. Don't, Bob. Bass was 20 yards away. Don't do it. I ain't going to let that son of a bitch Parker trick my neck for all them damn farmers to see me piss my pants. You might get prison. Bass knew better. Dozier had murdered two men in cold blood. Parker would hang him as soon as he was found guilty. Dozier had the gun in his left hand and was awkwardly trying to cock the hammer wobbly to pull around. Don't, Bob. Bass cocked his own colt, aimed carefully at the center of Dozier's body, and when the barrel of Dozier's colt started to come up to point at him, Bass squeezed the trigger. In the flash of his revolver, he saw the big slug take Dozier high in the chest, but the man still stood. Bass thought, all right, double tap, and shot him again in the forehead. Dozier went over backward and Bass walked up to him. He automatically ejected the spent shells from his colt, a habit he'd kept all these years after the command she had charged him and he had an unloaded rifle. 
He reached around for a new cartridges from his belt before he remembered that he had left his gun belt with the stallion. He looked down at the dead man. He had been chasing Dozier for three years. He felt almost nothing and did not know why. There wasn't much light, but he saw the hole in Dozier's head and noted that it was a little high and thought, oh yes, I always shoot high at night, just a little. I'll have to watch that. Then he started shaking and he didn't know if it was from the chill of the rain or from the killing. Even when it was necessary, and he had had no choice at all with Dozier and knew it in his heart, he did not like killing. It was such a waste. Two drovers dead and their horses stolen. Dozier lying face up in the mud, rain pouring into his unblinking eyes. Some mother must have loved him, must have suckled him, must have fed him and changed his diapers. Just a waste of everybody. Some was quick. Top story was that. Another killer and horse thief with a set of relay ranches, shacks in the woods who had killed drovers and stolen horses and sold them down across the river for years before Bass went after him. Bass did the usual preparation, checked his guns, had somebody read the warrants to him so he knew which one was stories, wrote his stallion wearing his good black hat with the flat brim turned up in the front so he could sight his rifle, Wore his good riding suit, had his boots shine in Fort Smith before he left, but took his mule and old clothes in case he needed to go in disguise. Did it all right and proper, figured on being gone at least two weeks, and then came around the corner and met Tom's story driving a herd of stolen horses across the river at the Delaware Band Crossing. Came riding right up on him, out of the brush, the two of them mounted and not 20 yards distant. Two seconds of surprise on both parts. Tom jerked first. Fill your hand, damn you, he yelled, and he fired wide to the right while Bass was drawing his left colt with his right hand, easing the hammer back as he pulled it from the holster, raising it while Story shot a second time and cut the right rein so close to Bass's fingers. He felt a breeze from the bullet. Bass had his weapon up by then, and he aimed, squeezed, and hit Story about a foot above the belt buckle. Story bent forward as if he'd been kicked in the stomach by a mule, and it was finished except that he still held that gun. So Bass cocked and fired again, taking him in the temple. Then it was truly over. Story's horse wheeled and carried the body some 20 yards before it fell off. Bass reloaded and thought, one day out, one day back. I didn't even get to the deadline. Some were hard. Horses were vital to people's welfare back then. There were no cars and trains did not come to that many towns. So horses were for riding, working, pulling, hauling, every kind of work. Still in horses then was like still in cars now. They were in huge demand. There were never enough of them and there was always a ready market. Jim Webb, a horse thief and a cold-blooded killer who actually carved notches in the wooden handle of his colt for every man he killed, 11, was very nearly fatal for Bass. Bass tracked, hunted, and hounded Webb for more than two years. Like Dozier and many other thieves, Webb had a series of relay stations. Relay ranches were very much like chop shops are for cars now. A stolen car is taken into a chop shop and either has its appearance radically altered and is resold or is cut up for parts. A stolen horse was taken to a relay at ranch where its brand was altered and allowed to heal and then it was moved through a series of relays until it was far enough away from its home not to be recognized. Then it was sold. One horse might be worth $40, a full month's pay for a hard-working man Horse thieves ran a big, lucrative business. Webb stole horses up in Kansas, over into Arkansas, relayed them through the Indian Territory, then down south across the Red River into Texas, where they were sold to the military or to ranchers and farmers. If a man had a horse or a ranch had a dozen of them and Webb wanted them, he simply frightened the owners enough to let him ride off with the stop, and if that didn't work, he murdered them. He was absolutely without mercy, and Bass was determined to get him. Webb knew that Bass was after him, and he kept changing relay stations and methods, always staying one jump ahead, until finally Bass decided to forego all other warrants until he got this one man. Following rumors, hints, guesses, and hunches, he worked across the deadline in the late 1894 and came to a stream of prints from at least 20 horses. He was riding the stallion this time. This time for disguise, he brought two geldings, both long-legged and tough, excellent long-distance runners. Webb was known for running long with spare mounts to get away, and Bass was planning to stay with him. But at the moment, things weren't going right. Bass had cornered a notorious small-time thief named Charlie One Finger, 
He had been born with only one finger on his left hand, near Shepherd's Crossing. Bass threatened him with a job dough work just for being a bad influence. Now, Charlie didn't tell him where Webb was hiding. Charlie lived in fear of coming up before Isaac Parker, and in his terror, told Bass that Webb was going to run a big herd of stolen horses down into Texas soon. Maybe he's doing it right now. Maybe you better go look. Now, Bass studied the prints. This was an older set of tracks, a cold trail. The edges of the hoof prints looked weathered and had been blown around. There had been no rain and no wind for at least three days, so the tracks were at least that old, probably more like a week. Could be Webb, Bass thought, and then shook his head, wishful thinking. Could be anybody. Still, somebody with a herd of more than 20 horses heading southeast was more likely up to no good. So he brought the stallion and the two geldings around on the trail and started to follow it. It was a beautiful day for a ride, even if he had crossed the deadline and had to watch every ridge and stand of trees for potential danger. The sun was coming up to noon and the warmth felt good on his shoulders, eased a small ache that was starting to visit him on a cold morning. He had ridden thousands of miles on hundreds of horses and been thrown by a few. And he supposed the new ache was a memory pain from getting thrown on his head and neck more times than he wanted to count. He was 70. In his work and life, in his thoughts, in his dreams at night, he was still in his 20s. But 70 summers had passed, and here he was, the stallion under him, his Winchester scabbard under his right leg, two colts at his waist, a double-barreled shotgun hanging by a leather loop from his saddle horn, a pocket full of corn dodgers, he still liked them for trail food, and a full canteen of water, still riding, still hunting. What the? The stallion had stopped and fidgeted as if there was a mare in season nearby. Bass studied the ground and saw that another group of horses had come into the older trail from the north, 10 or 12. It was hard to tell unless he got down and memorized the different tracks so he could identify and count them. No matter the count, the tracks were dead fresh. One must be a mare the stallion could still smell. The soil, where hooves had cut the earth and thrown it up, was still damp looking, and the sun was baking straight down. Not days, just hours ahead of him, maybe three hours. It was Webb. He didn't know why he felt so certain. God knew over the past two years he'd been close before, but never close at the right time. Either he only had the mule and couldn't get into a long chase, or he was escorting prisoners back to Fort Smith. There was always something, but this time it felt right. This time, this time. He healed the stallion into a faster pace, an easy trot. They would be walking the horses, and if they were three hours ahead, that couldn't be more than 10 or 12 miles. If he trotted, he'd be doing six of, to their three or four. In five hours, he'd be up with them. He had no plans as to how to handle Webb and the herd. With hoof prints this numerous, he couldn't tell how many riders Webb had with him. Three could handle a herd this size, but there could be many more. Ideally, he would catch up to them without being seen, wait his chance to get the drop on Webb. He had no illusions about Webb surrendering if there was the slightest chance he could fight his way free. Webb would run if he could, but if he couldn't run, he'd try to kill Bass. In any case, it was taken out of Bass's hands when he was still two miles from the herd. He knew they were close. The stallion had a mile-eating trot, and the two geldings had no trouble keeping up. Bass stopped to study the trail, felt a pile of fresh manure with the back of his hand, still warm. He remounted and hadn't gone another half mile when he saw something ahead. As he got closer, he saw it was an old boot top, cut off and sewed into a long pouch. This was the way many rustlers and thieves carried spare cartridges. He leaned down and picked it up with doubt dismounting and saw it had 50 or 60 44 40 cartridges inside. No good to him with the 38 40 handguns and rifle, but he dropped it into a saddlebag and had just face front when a man came loping around the bend ahead of him, looking for his lost ammunition. The man was so surprised, he didn't stop his horse for another 30 or 40 yards. He was still more than 100 yards away, but Bass pulled his rifle. The man hauled on his horse so hard it almost went over backward. He wheeled and dug in his spurs. Bass could hear his horse grunt in pain, even from a hundred yards away. The man wasn't wet, but Bass spurred the stallion into a run to keep up. Running loose, the stallion could have caught the man easily, but pulling the two geldings slowed him a bit. 
Bass didn't want to let the Geldings go, thinking he would need them if a chase developed. He didn't try to catch the rider, but held pace with him as they rounded the bend, and he saw the herd of horses about a mile and a half distant. There were two riders. The man running in front of him yelled, and when the two riders still didn't see him, the man pulled his pistol and shot in the air. They both willed. The rider on the left just sat looking, but the one on the right spurred his horse and started north up a gully that led to the top of a flat plain that had no visible end. He was pulling two horses running there and back of him as Bass was, and Bass nodded. Webb, that would be Webb. It would be a chase. For a second, Bass was surprised that Webb headed onto a flat prairie to run north, where there would be no place to hide, but then realized it was the right move. Webb had no choice. If he tried to run around the herd and head west or south, it would take too long, and Bass might come within range for a shot. Bass was accurate. No one would let him compete in the turkey shoots because... He always won, and everybody in the territory knew it, especially criminals. Webb was moving faster than Bass was, but Bass made no attempt to increase the stallion's speed. The big stud was the best horse Bass had ever owned, but he'd been ridden all morning, and Webb had probably been changing his mount from the herd he was pushing. Still, the stallion's long legs would keep them in sight. There would be plenty of time to close the gap. The way Webb was running, he'd blow the first house horse out in half an hour just when the stallion would start to slow, and then they'd both be onto their remounts, and if Webb kept up the pace, the remounts would last no more than a half hour each. That made the chase at the most another hour and a half. 22 miles, maybe, not more than 25 or 27. Bass took a quick look back at the stallion, barreled up the coulee and onto the flats, the gelding scrambling to keep up. The other two men were running south, and the damn fools were taking the horse herd with them, which would slow them down too much to get away if Bass came back for them. In any event, they weren't coming after him to help Webb. Loyalty was a scarce commodity with the gangs. Knowing this had saved his life hundreds of times. If gangs had ever worked together, he'd have been dead by now. The stallion tripped on a soft gopher mound and Bass held his head up, felt him through his legs to see if he was weave, weaving, getting tired, but he was still moving well. It was just a momentary stumble. Still slightly slower than Webb, but the speed was even and out. What was 20, 30 miles ahead? Bass had wandered up there when he was a fugitive two or three times. He hadn't liked to get too far north because some of the tribes up there were as hostile as the Comanches. All the way up to Kansas, if his memory was accurate, were rolling shallow hills, undulations in the prairie, which was good. He needed the hills if the chase got too long to close the distance, assuming all the horses were about equal. The stallion had seen Webb's horses ahead of him now and knew they were in a chase. He had done this many times. Bass let him pick his own speed and was gratified to see he was gaining just a little. Bass checked his gear for the third or fourth time, pulled his canteen up and took a sip, rolling easy with the stallion, looked back to make sure the gildings were moving well. 20 minutes passed and he was only a mile back now, but the stallion was pulling longer breaths and Bass knew he would have to change mount soon. 10, 15 more minutes and he would be starting to drop back if Webb held the same speed. 15 minutes and the stallion told Bass it was time to, by starting the slight weave. He was getting tired. Bass didn't want to blow the horse out, so when the weed became pronounced, he pulled the big animal to a stop and fastened the cinch as he dismounted. He drew the blanket out from beneath the loosened saddle, slapped it on the first gelding, then threw the saddle, rifle, scabbard, and bags over on the blanket, tightened the cinch, pulled the bridle off the stallion, buckled it on the gelding. He was remounted and moving inside a minute and a half. The stallion followed willingly, glad to have Bess's weight off his back. As soon as Bass had stopped, Webb had stopped too and changed mounts. He was slightly faster and gained a bit. Bass wasn't worried yet. As long as he held his own through the second horse, it didn't matter if Webb was under the impression that he'd move further away from Bass. Bass would make his move on the third horse. The plan was based on the thorough knowledge of horses and how they ran. Like people, horses used more energy and did more damage to their muscles and joints running downhill than they did uphill. Even a shallow downhill, downslope, would jar their shoulders and back and quickly cause powerful fatigue. Years ago, an old and peaceful Comanche had come to visit the Cree family and told Boss Bass how he was able to outrun Texas Rangers, even when the Rangers had better mounts. As soon as they can't see you, get off and run downhill. Then before they see you again, get on and ride. They think you ride all the time. They ride the whole time. You only ride uphill and flat. Pretty soon their horses stop or horses keep running. Bass had used the method many times to catch fugitives. He even had a pair of flat heel boots for better running. Most of the men wore high heels to keep their feet from slipping through the stirrups, 
which could get mean getting dragged to death, which could mean getting dragged to death. Bass had told nobody of his method, not even other deputies, for fear that it would be used by the outlaws. So far, none of them seemed to know about it. An hour passed and Bass's gelding ran easy. The stallion knew what would happen and stayed grazing where Bass had left him. They were almost exactly even in speed. Webb would gain a little, then Bass would gain it back. At the end of the second half hour, the gelding started blowing and made a slight leave. Bass quickly stopped him, hoping Webb would do the same. Again, Webb was a little faster changing the saddle than Bass, but soon they were both moving again, still about a mile apart, both horses running easily the first 15 minutes. Bass took his feet out of the stirrups and shook his legs to loosen them. As the gelding started down a shallow slope, they dropped out of Webb's sight, and Bass quickly dismounted and ran easily down to the bottom. Not fast, but steady perhaps only 200 yards. Then he remounted, and as he came up the rise, he saw that Webb had gained almost 100 yards. Webb saw it as well, and his reaction pleased Bass. Webb probably thought Bass's horse was blown, and he pushes that harder, trying to gain enough to get out of sight, but at great expense. Meanwhile, whenever Webb was out of sight, moving down, Bass got off and ran. His horse actually seemed to find energy and stamina, and soon Bass started to close in on Webb dramatically. Webb whipped his horse harder, Three quarters of a mile, then half a mile separated them, and Webb knew he'd been duped. His horse was weaving and staggering. It was all over. Webb stopped his horse, turned him, pulled his rifle from the scabbard, wrapped his reins on the saddle horn, and spurred his horse straight at Bass, firing as he came. It was a brave, stupid thing to do, Bass thought, pulling his own rifle from the scabbard. Webb should have got off and fought cover, found cover, fought it out. Bass heard Webb's bullets going past, but they were wild. One came close enough to make the telltale crack in his ear, which meant it was only inches away. That was close enough. When they were 400 yards apart, Bass pulled the gelding to a stop, stepped down in back of him, and aimed over the horse's back, squeezing the trigger. He watched the bullet take Webb off his horse backward. Webb lay still. His horse moved off 15 or 20 yards and then stood stuck in air. Bass remounted, used his knees to steer the gelding up to where Webb lay, aiming his rifle at him the whole way. He had learned long ago never to trust a downed man, and Webb was still moving, his legs shoving his feet into the dirt. Bass stopped 15 yards away. Can you hear me? Yeah. Webb's voice was muffled, and he fought to turn over on his side. He propped up on el one elbow, then sat up. You got shot me. Bass saw the deep red blood staining the front of Webb's shirt. He saw Webb's rifle 10 yards off to the side where it had flown when he went down and saw that his side arm holster was empty as well, the colt not clean when he hit the dirt. Webb might still had a hideout gun, but he would have to move fast to get it. And, what, and Webb, Bass knew, was done moving fast. Webb squinted up at Bass. He had dirt in his hair, in his eyes, all over his face. The evening sun seemed to give him a ghostly pallor. How'd you catch me? I ran downhill, rode up. My horse rested on the downhill. Yours kept working. Learned it from a Comanche. Damn Comanches. Webb trailed off grunting. The shock of the wound had kept the pain away for a few moments. Now it came. God, this hurts. How long do you think I've got? Bass knew what the dark blood meant. Webb's liver had been hit. Gut shot men with whole livers could live days. The pain so harsh it almost destroyed their minds. With the liver hit, it wouldn't be an hour. Webb would bleed out inside. But Bass said nothing. Webb would learn soon enough. You're tough, Reeves. Webb grunted the word slowly and painfully. I want you to have my scabbard. Rifle. Take him. Bass nodded. Is there anybody to tell you got kin? Webb tried to laugh, but only winced. Not, not want to claim me. He fell silent, eyes closed, leaning precariously on one elbow. Bass thought he was dying. But then his eyes opened and he smiled. Would you tell the truth to a dying man? I might. They say you shot Billy Leach. Throw in a bacon grease on your dog. But he fell on the fire. You let it burn. Bass sighed, remembering he had been in disguise pretending to be a horse thief, sitting with a gang cooking bacon. He had his hound with him, a dog he was very fond of, and that he had had a long time, and Billy had thrown hot grease on the dog's head just to hear it scream. Later, the court let Bass go, saying he was cleaning his rifle and that it went off by mistake. 
I like that dog. Did you shoot him? Right in the neck. He burned. Only his arm hit the fire. But you let it burn? You didn't feel it. Reeves, you're... Wes never found out what Webb was going to say. Webb closed his eyes and fell back. He died just as the sun dropped below the edge of the horizon. Bass sat next to him for a while, wishing there was some wood to make a fire. Wishing he was home. Thinking of this, thinking of that, and then nothing. Sighing, he stood and fetched Webb's horse and dragged the body across the saddle, tying it in place, using a rein for a lead rope. Then he mounted his gelding, turned around, and started off. He'd have to walk Webb's horse until it could regain some strength. 20, 25 miles just to get back to where the run started, and then another hundred back to Fort Smith at a slow walk. A long way home. Summer rests were very hard. It took him 10 days to get back to Fort Smith with Webb, and Bass needed rest. He had thought of it all the way back. Just go sit at the ranch for a few days, maybe a week. But when he entered Fort Smith, it did not seem the same place as when he had left. Men who would normally have stopped to pass the time moved across the street to get away from him. Racial prejudice was always a problem for Bass, especially when he became the most successful deputy and was put in charge of white men who did not want to work under an African-American. There had been a few incidences, minor problems really, but his reputation was huge, and so was he. Six foot two, when most men were five foot three or four. He was aware of racial slurs. Today he thought that men were upset because he was the one who'd finally got Webb. But then he reconsidered. Other deputies seemed to be afraid of him for some reason. They would nod, give a tight little smile, and move away quickly. It made no sense. Most of them had always been sociable, and now there wasn't even the usual curiosity as to how he had tracked and captured Webb. At last, he could stand it no more, and he cornered one of the senior deputies, a man named Leo Bennett. What's wrong with everybody? They seem scared of me. They are, Bennett said, nodding. I'm a little worried myself. What the hell are you talking about? Let's walk a little, Bennett said. They were out in front of the courthouse, away from the other folks. I got some bad news for you, Bass, real bad. The worst there is. They moved across the street to an empty spot. What's happened is, Bennett said, I'd, all, I'd give almost anything to not have this conversation. What is it? Your son, Benny. He murdered his wife and ran. He's out in the territory and Parker sent down a warrant on him. He had to. It's just sitting in there on the warrant bench. There wasn't a marshal or deputy here would touch it. They're all afraid of what you'd do to them if they had to, you know, shoot him. Bass seemed just sad. Benny, my boy. After a moment, he took a breath, straightened. Certainly did it. Bennett hesitated, then nodded. No doubt at all. He caught her with another man. After he did it, he yelled to witnesses that he had shot her for being unfaithful and that he would never come back alive. Damn fool kid. Bass shook his head to clear it. He remembered his son as a small boy smiling up at his father as they worked on the ranch side by side. That boy, now a cold-blooded killer. Bass felt the bile rise in his throat and sucked air through his teeth to fight the nausea. Sorry, Bass. Sorry I can, as I can be, but we have to go after him. You know the rules. Bass looked down the street, long street toward the gallows at the end. I'll go get it. Bennett shook his head. God, Bass, you can't. What if he, what if it goes bad? Then I'll do what has to be done. I have to be the one who gets him. It's the only way he has a chance. With somebody else, he's sure to fight. And they will have to put him down. It has to be me. I can talk to him. I'll change horses and head out this afternoon. Tell the other men, even if they see him to not, you know. Bennett nodded. Don't worry. They're too scared of you to come close to him. When did he, when did he leave? Three days ago. Don't tell my wife. Leave that to me. When I get back, I'll... Bass walked away without finishing his sentence. He took two horses from his string in the livery barn, changed his saddle from the stallion, which along with gelding, needed at least a week of grain and good food to get weight back on. And after filling his canteen and stopping at a dry goods store for coffee, bacon, cornmeal, and jerky, he left Fort Smith. He hadn't been in town for hours. He had taken a big mare, a good distance horse, and reliable when she wasn't in season, and he set out at a fast pace. 
There was an urgency neither he nor Bennett had mentioned, but that both men knew. Benny was Bass Reeve's son. There were enough hard men in the territory who hated Bass enough to take delight in killing his son or capturing him for ransom. Bass rode straight and hard all the rest of that day and through the night. As he rode, he stilled himself to put images of Benny as a boy out of his mind. Bass had a sudden vivid mental image of Benny when he was three years old. He was naked and standing in the yard, holding onto the fur on the back of an old yard dog. Wherever the dog went, Benny would run alongside, hanging onto the fur. It was just the cutest thing, Bass thought. Nellie would laugh, laugh, watching the little boy running in the dust naked, determined, his little hand gripping the fur as if he would never let go, never let go. God, he thought, don't, don't do this to me, please. He tried not to picture his son at his wedding, his pretty dark eyed bride Tess. Bass allowed himself only once to wonder how his son, his boy, had wound up a killer, a killer out here. Bass turned his attention to the job that lay ahead and told himself that he was going after a criminal, just like any other, nothing more. Bass, it was his son, but it was still a chase and he was still Bass Reeves. He rode dry eyed the rest of the night. He got to the store at Miller's Crossing. Fat old Ben Grist owned the store. If a shack that sold hardly anything but whiskey could be called a store, and he was usually drunk enough to be talkative. If not, he could be urged to talk, and Bass was in a mood where urging wouldn't be a problem for him. Christ was ready. The key came through here two, no, three days ago, he said through a bearded foul with food and whiskey and tobacco spit. On a sorrel gelding, and he had run him until he looked like he was covered in life, so never saw a horse so lathered up. Which way did he go? Started west, but I come out watching. As soon as he was down the trail of might, he turned and moved up north, up into that break country. You'll never find him up there. No, sir, you won't get that one. He got clean away. Bass ignored him, moved outside, and remounted and headed north. It was rough country up north, but old man Grist had been wrong. The break country was all bad gullies and sharp little rock canyons. So rough, it left only a limited number of places you could take a horse. If Benny had gone in there, Bass would find him. Bass had lived in the breaks for months when he was a fugitive and knew every nook and cranny. It was just a matter of time now, time and patience. He worked up into the breaks with care, saving his horse. As he rode, he thought back to the witch dog long ago. Things will change. Of course, Bass's whole life had been full of change. But this mission, yes, things had changed in the most terrible way. On the fourth day, he found him. He found the tracks of a single horse just after daybreak. Once the mare saw they were following the tracks, he let her have her way and scanned ahead. They were in an area of small, sharp-walled rock key canyons where the experienced criminals never hid because they knew it was a trap. The only way out was the way they come in. But Benny had never been an outlaw and didn't think that. In one of the small canyons, Bass came around a bend and saw a rock-walled shack that had been abandoned by homesters long ago. Benny's horse was hauled out in some grass to the right. He rode straight in, stopped in front of the shack, dismounted and called, you got coffee on? He heard footsteps scramble and then the old door opened. Benny was holding the gun, but when he saw Bass, he put it down against the inside wall. I knew you'd be the one to come. It had to be me. It was the only way. I don't have any coffee. I've got some. Bass took the coffee and went a pot out of the saddlebag and handed them to Benny. Put some on while I hobble my mare. Bass heard Benny rattle on a small stove lid and then a fire started. He dealt with the mare and then sat down next to the shack on a big rock in the sun. He had never smoked and now he wished he had started just to have something to do with his hands. What am I going to do, Pa? Benny come back out. What's going to happen? You have to go back and stand for it. But I caught her. She was right there and it don't matter. You got to stand for it. But why? Because... Bass said, sighing, looking out across the grass, looking at everything, looking at nothing, past the edge of the world, because it's the law. He paused and looked up to study his son. The law. It's not just the white man's rules anymore, son, and free men live by the law. 